And adaptive music is music that actually changes itself depending on your activity. So if you're, for example, exercising and you're going for a run, then our music can adapt itself. So the faster you run, the faster the music becomes. So you maybe go from like hip hop, that's a bit more slow to maybe house music. And if you run really, really fast, you can actually get like drum and bass, which has 174 beats per minute. So super, super fast. Uh, and it can also like link the energy of the song to your heart rate. So if your heart rate's going high, the actual energy of the song and the loudness and the drums go up. And so we've been really looking at this idea of adaptive music. Uh, so fitness is just one application, but we also work in gaming. We work in virtual reality. We work in brand and advertising as well. We focus right now on radio adverts, right? So very old traditional kind of medium of advertising. And I don't know if you've ever used a streaming service where you're like, let's say you're listening to some music and you're with your friends and you're having a barbecue, let's say, and then this advert comes in and the advert's really annoying. So you turn it down and then you have to wait for the advert to finish and you turn it up again. And let's say you're listening to like reggae and it's like really kind of like nice and chilled. And then this advert comes in and someone's trying to sell your phone and you're like, oh my God. And all your friends go, dude, why don't you just pay for your streaming service? They so don't get adverts, right? What we can actually do is a really clever piece of technology that when the advert's going to play, we first understand what music you're already listening to. And we actually put that type of music underneath the advert. So it becomes a musical advert. So let's say you're listening to reggae, you'll get a reggae version of the advert. Or if you're listening to like dance music, you actually get like a dance high energy version of the advert. And it actually seamlessly goes from the music to the advert to the next song again in a way that really kind of sounds kind of quite nice. And the data we've shown, because we've run this over 100 million times now in America, that not only do people listen to the whole advert more often because they actually like it, but they engage with the advert more. So if, there's a, if they're actually on their laptops and there's a button to click to buy a thing, they click that button two and a half times more often. So it's a massive increase. And that's just because of the, the difference between what we call a symphonic advert. So one that is musically sympathetic to what you're listening to and one that's static. We're just under 20 people now. So we're quite a small company uh, based in London. And um, we had an office in Battersea until last year. And of course, everyone started working from home. Um, and our plans last year, so if you spoke last year, I would have told you we're going to open up an office in New York because we have, um, you know, a lot of our customers are in the US, whether they're media agencies or um, streaming or even some of the bigger labels that have their headquarters there. Uh, we were also looking to maybe expand into Asia as well. Um, but I think I've probably changed my mind now. I feel like this last year with remote working and people being very used to interacting very like closely with partners across the world, I don't really know if we need to physically internationally expand for a while until we get maybe to another level of the company and we're looking at customer support and being on the right time zones and maybe understand the culture more clear, carefully so that we can kind of really better integrate into those economies. Studied till I was 27. And then I started my first company. I never worked for anyone. And so I never, under, I never knew what it was like for someone to pay me money. I never had the, the comfort of, okay, now I can pay my rent. Now I can buy this. I never, I never had that. So for me, it wasn't something that was scary to do. Um, and after I sold the first company, I, you know, had the option. I did some investments and things. I actually really didn't enjoy it myself. Um, I thought it'd be more fun, but I felt like I am investing in another company to go and have all the fun. And I'm sitting here at home, like, okay, now you have some of this. Now you have some of this. And so I was really interested in. Um, the ability to uh, start it again, right? And to really build up a team again. 
I thought it'd be a lot easier the second time. It really wasn't. I think some of it's like it's a it's a it's a very different industry. All the team members are new again. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's been really really fun. I really enjoy just coming up with a concept and really kind of having people believe in your vision. And I remember we we became part of this um, incubator scheme in London that's part of Abbey Road Studios. So that's where the Beatles made their big albums and Pink Floyd. Um, and we were able to present in front of all these like music industry executives, whether they're technical or producers and engineers, and we were going to do it. Actually, I think it's in Studio Two, again, where the Beatles wrote like one of their albums. And it's a, so it's a very important stage. And I remember being backstage and I'm going to go on with the mic and I'm going to present. I'm like, I can't believe I'm just like, we come up with this crazy idea. And like six months later, we're presenting to the music industry what we think the future of music is. And we're not really qualified, right? Like I play the piano, fine, but I don't get how this industry works. And yet it really kind of has really taken on. And I think some of our um, kind of naivety in, in knowing the restrictions of the industry has meant that we've had the courage to make certain moves because we didn't know you can't do that. So we just did it. I don't know if you understand what I mean. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been really good. I've realized because I have a lot of founder friends now in London and they do everything. Um, and so some of them are much less technical. Some of them are more financial. So for me, I'm very technical. So if I have a challenge to solve and I want to compete with competition or differentiate, I tend to do it through technology than through innovation. Others might do it through business and say, let's have a different business model or let's price it differently, right? So I think having your own type of expertise is useful. It doesn't have to always be the same. Um, what you do have to have is um, probably a compassion for what you what you do because it's gonna be so tough. I mean, if I draw a graph over the last few years of my confidence in AI music as a company to succeed, like it goes up and it goes down and it goes like up and down again. And literally every month it's up and it never changes. It's not like, yay, and we finished, right? It's always like this. So to have the resilience, the ability to really kind of like see through those difficult days, I think is um, there's a toughness to that, but there's also really believing in your mission and really believing that kind of what you're doing is in line with your values. So whether that's changing the world, whether that's creating this like amazing new product that makes people's lives easier um, and all those types of things. So I think that what I'm seeing as a common trait across founders is really that.